Hiya Booktube! Well, welcome to Middlemarch Meditation number 11. Yeah, I know. I'm surprised too. Look, strictly speaking, what we should be covering today is the remaining pages of chapter 4. And, you know, doing our usual close reading, trying to tease out something more from the text than what just appears there on first glance. But I read through the remaining pages, and uh, frankly, it was difficult to find any depth in those passages. I'll, I'll just recount the action for you, but you've, you've certainly read it, I, I don't doubt. After telling Dorothea that there are these pamphlets waiting for her in the library from Mr. Casalvin, Mr. Brooke follows his niece into that room, yeah, and they have a conversation where M Mr. Brooke reveals, no surprise, that Mr. Casalvin has made an offer of marriage. It's also no real surprise that Dorothea accepts the offer. Mr. Brooke then makes um, well, I'm sure he thinks they're valiant and noble, but they're really rather lukewarm efforts to dissuade her. Really, all he does is he hints at the reasons why it might be preferable to marry Sir James Chetham instead. But we know, you know, Dorothea, she made up her mind long before she got to that library. And Mr. Brooke, you know, like all people who don't realize their own prejudices and they really don't want to do anything to change that situation. He just lumps Dorothea together with all the other women he's ever known. And I guess he's had some difficulties with them because he concludes that as a group, they are all impossible to understand. Here's the quote from page 42. In short, woman, woman, <laughs> all of us, uh, woman was a problem which, since Mr. Brooke's mind felt blank before it, could hardly be less complicated than the revolutions of an irregular solid. I have no idea what the revolutions of an irregular solid are. I perhaps should have looked that up. We could have had a bit of depth figuring out what on earth is he talking about there. That's obviously some aspect of physics that was um, engaging people at the time. So I just did not feel, you know, the business of, of the marriage negotiation, I, I just couldn't find in myself enough ideas to form a meditation. So so we're going to go, okay, that happened. What I really want to focus on is one passage in those pages which caught my attention. And it's a, a subject that, it's an, a subject area that has been brought up in previous meditations, but we've never really focused on it and seen how the book is dealing with that subject area ongoing. So that's what I'd like to do just now. We've been informed, back on page 37 near the bottom, that Mr. Brook, one of the things that he was doing besides having lunch with Mr. Casalvin, was he had gone to the county town, quote, about a petition for the pardon of some criminal. Now, this is probably the first time that we get a sense of Mr. Brook as is something more than a man who, who reads a lot, but seems to have nothing as a result of all his knowledge, if that makes sense. Evidently, he must have some legal or political influence locally. As the library conversation begins, on page 38, and, and you see I've got it underlined here, Dorothea bethought herself now of the condemned criminal, and she asks her uncle, what news have you brought about the sheep stealer? So we, we know the nature of the crime now. We don't know how many sheep, <laughs> are involved that is that's the thing that could be one or 300 difficult to difficult to tell but let's let's assume one just because it i think it takes more than one man i would say i mean you know perhaps if you have a good dog and one man you might be able to do a larger number of sheep but i i, I imagine that one man possibly one sheep let's say that for argument's sake mr brooke replies what? Poor Bunch. Well, it seems we can't get him off. He is to be hanged. This uh, this is always, when you read 19th century novels, always a little bit crazy to get your head around. And uh, the, the person who watches television is also a genealogist, and he does regularly go down to our local record office and looks through criminal records. Uh, he's also recording a local policeman's diary. So he does get to see a lot of the penalties for crimes. And penalties for crimes were 
unbelievably harsh. I, I think we find it kind of weird to think that, you know, for the for stealing one sheep, the penalty would be death. Uh, but, uh, but it was. It was it was very, very harsh in those days. And if we carry on reading, let's see if I can just shift my page. Oh, look at me. Getting better at this. Dorothea's brow took an expression of reprobation and pity. Reprobation meaning, you know, uncle, did you not save this poor man? as well as pity. And Mr. Brooke goes on, he perhaps hasn't noticed that he's being told off. Hanged, you know, said Mr. Brooke with a quiet nod. Poor Romilly. He would have helped us. I knew Romilly. Casalban didn't know Romilly. He is a little buried in books, you know, Casalban is. That's his first hint to Dorothea before he's even mentioned the offer of marriage, basically. But it's interesting because he talks about Romilly, this, 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 person, Romilly, who might have helped. Let me put another image on screen really quickly for you. Not that you'll necessarily go, oh yes, him, but <laughs> let me give you a little bit of a background. This is Sir Samuel Romilly, who lived from 1757, consults notes, 1757 to 1818. He was a lawyer and a member of parliament, and he dedicated himself for I think at least a decade, he supported the abolition of slavery along with Wilberforce. But more importantly, he worked very hard for law reform to change some of these really harsh penalties for smaller crimes. He was a man of very high personal principles, it seems. When he met the Prince of Wales in 1804, for example, uh, the prince offered him a seat in Parliament and uh, Romilly turned it down, which to the prince's face, which takes I think I think it takes a lot of, you know, something, or at least it would have done back in the early 1900s. In Romilly's own words, when he was asked to comment on, you know, why he turned it down, he said, I was averse to being brought into Parliament by any man, but by the Prince almost above all others. To be under personal obligations to of that kind to him, to be in a situation in which as a lawyer and as a politician, he might repose a particular confidence in me was what I above all things dreaded. So he, he really did have strong principles. And this is obviously the man that he would have been dead by the time, you know, okay, Middlemarch is a fictional narrative, but it's taking place in a very specific period of time, a, roughly 1829 to 1931. So unfortunately, Romilly died in 1818. So he was no longer around to help with reform. So I, I guess Mr. Brooke thought he might have been helpful as a lawyer to argue the case for this uh, Mr., this Bunch, Mr. Bunch, who has uh, stolen sheep. But as it is, nothing has saved him and the man is going to die for this crime. Let me just remove the image there and we'll go back to the text. Now, I also found there's, there's so many informative websites online. This is from the History of Parliament online. Leave a link in the description box because, you know, if, if you're really into this stuff, you'll want to look at all these little things. And they have a longer biography of Samuel Romilly. And um, let's see. Oh, that was where I got my quote from. Yeah. <laughs> I'm getting mixed up in my own notes, everyone. You're being so patient. We thank you. Thank you. Thank you. This mention of Romilly. If we think back to everything that we've covered so far, just the first four chapters, He's just one of many indirect references, right, to things that were, were actually going on in England politically at the time. And I have dug up an article by Jerome Beatty. Now, you, I didn't know Jerome Beatty. You might not know Jerome Beatty, but Jerome Beatty was a very well-known Eliot and Dickens scholar. So back in the in 40s, 50s, early 60s, and of course his... His books cost a lot now, so <laughs> that's uh, that's telling me. I think what was it he wrote? Uh, Middlemarch from notebook to novel. If you type that into a Google search, Middlemarch from notebook to novel, you'll see just how expensive the the, the, the few copies of that book of his are. So his re opinion is obviously still very much respected. And I'm going to read here from his article about the political situation as described in Middlemarch. He says, few readers notice how many details from the political history of a period 40 years prior to the time of composition are present throughout Middlemarch. 
I wish here to give some idea of the nature and pervasiveness of those details, though indeed there are so many I cannot include them all, and to indicate how George Eliot managed to keep them, numerous as they are, from obtruding upon the fiction. The events in Middlemarch are supposed to have taken place, here we go, he actually lays this down, between 30th of September, 1829, and the end of May, 1832. Uh, I, I'm going to have to write that down somewhere just so that I realize that. He said, most of the historical references in the novel, therefore, concern events and personalities involved in the struggle for political reform, which culminated in the passage of the first reform bill in June, 1832. For roughly the first half of this period, the Tories, under Wellington, that is the Duke of Wellington, Peel and George IV, they are in control. And though they are forced to give ground grudgingly on some issues, Catholic emancipation, for instance, they manage to hold out against the forces of reform, even against such moderate reform as that urged by men like Huskisson. Now, I believe Huskisson is a character we'll encounter later in Middlemarch. We haven't yet. With the death of George IV in June 1830 and the assumption of power by the Whigs uh, under Lord Grey in November, reform of some kind is inevitable. Interest centers on the parliamentary election of 1831, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So wh what's interesting is that, the, the, so in other words, at the point of the death of George IV, the balance of power shifted. And, and suddenly what, what had been a conservative-dominated parliament could now become a Whig-dominated parliament, and, and there was the, the potential for reform. He goes on to say, in Middlemarch, political events manifest themselves early, though at first only as background. In chapter three, now we've, we've read this, Mr. Brooke is showing Casalban documents on machine breaking and brick burning, which we noted in an earlier meditation. A few pages earlier, George Eliot, in one of the few historical utterances made directly to the reader in the novel, speaks of these anti-reform times. And we do remember that. And then beginning with the scene, you know, that we're going to, we're not really reading here, but the, as part of the library conversation that Mr. Brooke has with Dorothea, he does remark that Casalban may be made a bishop, quote, if Peel stays in. Okay. Which is interesting because that situates Mr. Casalban quite solidly in a political position. In other words, Peel Wellington, George IV, they're all on the, the conservative against reform side in 1829. And Casalban could become a bishop if Peel stays in government, meaning it's it's only people like Peel who belong to sort of an old school, you know, let's not change anything mindset. They're the kind of people that would honor a man like Casalban. But oddly enough, Dorothea, she, you know, it's funny, she doesn't seem to have a lot of political savvy in some ways. I'm not sure about that, but I don't see her commenting. I mean, I can see that she's enthusiastic about reform and is looking at cottages, but I think, you know, to, to what degree does she understand the politics that, okay, I don't understand them greatly, but I now have a, a sense of how the party divide fell. Did she understand that if Casalban is aligned with Peel, then he is aligned with Wellington, he's aligned with George IV, he's therefore completely anti-reform. Does she get that? Does that does that make her think, wait a second, wait a second, I am building cottages because I believe to some degree in, you know, is she going to, is she going to put those two and two together, basically? These instances that Beatty mentions, they're the ones we've encountered in the novel so far, and there are going to be more, but what I thought was interesting that Eliot should choose to set her novel during this sort of this, this crux period, you know, just before the king dies and just after. In other words, when, when things are going to shift, it's a seismic shift. Things have to resettle and they're not quite the same afterwards. Monarchs had a greater influence on, on politics then than they do now. And, and that's probably because the only people who were permitted to vote, it was a much smaller body. It was, it was men with a certain value of personal property, land. So Eliot's, you know, you know, picked that turning point to set her story in. And that's interesting because she is paying attention to the events of that turning point, which means it, it, it must somehow, the story must somehow move with it. You know, I don't know. BT goes on. He notes the way historical events and persons are handled in Middlemarch. He says, already we can see certain of George Eliot's techniques 
for handling political history. She introduces it largely through references to historical personages. She mentions but never explains issues. That's true. She scatters references to the same person or issue through the novel rather than lumping them in a single paragraph or chapter. She separates the event from the specific dates. In other words, she presents history dramatically, that's how he feels, within the story as part of the lives of the characters. She rarely offers it directly to the reader as history. Well, do you know what? I'm grateful, even though I'll admit that up until this point, I hadn't really seen Middlemarch as a historical novel, and I will now change my perspective on that. I'm really glad that she doesn't stop and and give some authors do that don't they they stop the action and and the narrator i mean obviously we know that the author feeds the narrator everything they know but the narrator stops to sort of help you out <laughs> let me put you in the picture and and sometimes sometimes those can be the most uh, what's the word i wanted to use the word tiresome and i thought oh now be nice do you do you ever have a little bit of sort of a mini despair when you reach a point like that in a novel where, where the action's been going along and you've been watching the characters interact and all of a sudden, narrator interrupts, action stops and the narrator's just talking to you for several paragraphs to sort of put you in the picture. Do you ever find you just your mood just dips a little bit at those points in a book? Mine, mine does a little because I think, you know, I think of the author, I think they've done so much research. I mean, good for them. Good for them. Research is a good thing. I don't know that I kind of want to be hit with it like, you know, bricks in a bag. I, I wish there was a way that, that you could take all this incredible knowledge that you obviously acquired to make the book feel like it it belongs in the period you've put it. But I, I really wish you wouldn't just kind of, in a way, you do kind of betray the fact that the book that that you, you you break the spell of oh I'm in 1830 you break the spell of I'm in 1830 when the narrator interrupts to give you a lecture on what happened in 1830 because you think well I'm obviously not in 1830 now am I because I have a professor who's just who's just stopped the projector and is standing up at the front of the classroom now to give me a little recap about the events that happened in 1830 so I know that where I really am or, or maybe it just gives you a strange staggered sense of time there's story time narrator time and then the time that you're reading the book in and that's a lot of that's a lot of times and and I must admit there's there's always something attractive about a book that keeps the dramatic going so that you once you decide that you're going to suspend disbelief and sink into the pages then you're there and it's done you know, no more but I, I won't go on about that that's just a that's just a personal preference personal preference so just at one further quote from Beattie. He says, it is surely the subtlety and the indirectness with which George Eliot introduces and uses historical dates, issues, and events, which largely accounts for the average reader's impression that there are only a few minor references to political history in Middlemarch, and the reader's feeling that this is not in any sense a historical novel. Well, that, yeah. Yeah, I admit, I hadn't thought of it as a historical novel. But as as I went on reading Beatty's article, and he kept pulling up instances, the sheer number of them, and, and then him telling me, this isn't everything. I haven't been I haven't been exhaustive. I thought, well, wow, you know, the number that you've mentioned and, and the way they affect the characters. Yeah, I began to think, actually, this, this, this is an historical novel written in the 1870s about the 1830s. And, and maybe Dorothea... I'm just wondering with her enthusiasm for reform and her desire to do a great work for the less fortunate, is she, is she being put forward as the kind of the spirit of the age, the, the moving spirit of the age? I, I'm speculating, you know, because I love doing that. But it makes sense that Dorothea, as this spirit of reform, that, that her story is going to be how she encounters different forms of opposition. Yeah, the man she wants to marry will almost certainly oppose her. Mr. Brooke, he tries to warn her. He says, Casalban does not know Romilly, hint, 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 hint. In other words, you know, yeah, it's a loaded statement. Not only is that saying that Casalban literally hasn't paid any attention to the politics that were around him when he was a young man, when Romilly would have been in the news and would have been doing something. But I think it's also saying that Casalban and Romilly, I mean, they might as well come from different planets. That's how little they have in common philosophically. Casalban has already, you know, disappointed Dorothea by having absolutely no interest in her in her cottage plans. You know, bizarrely, it is Sir James Chetham, whom Dorothea despises, 
who has shown some interest in reform, hasn't he? Back in chapter two, he was talking about how he was studying Humphrey Davies' uh, agricultural chemistry. And he's building these cottages, according to Dorothea's plans, on his own land. That being said, and I don't know why I feel this, I suspect that Sir James isn't in the end going to be much better than Reverend Casalba. Now, why do I think that? It's what the narrator says back on page 21. If you have your book handy, flip back. It's the narrator explaining Sir James think why he's perfectly happy to marry a wife whom he will allow to dominate him a little bit, help him make decisions, maybe even make those decisions for him. And, and, he, and he says, in short, he's, he's comfortable about that because he's a man. Here's the quote, a man could always put down when he liked. So in other words, he could let his wife do what she wants, but as soon as he thinks, ah, no, he just he just has to call attention to the fact that he's male. Which And, and of course, the, the paragraph ends talking about the value of tradition. So Sir James Chetham, for all his, you know, oh yeah, I'll build cottages and I'll read Humphrey Davy, he's nevertheless a man that what makes him feel very comfortable, what makes him liberal and kind and seemingly flexible and, and, and changeable is the fact that he knows his position, his traditional position as a man with money, that that won't be challenged, that that won't be changed, though, that he won't ever have to fear that will change. So I think his appetite for reform would drop dramatically if he got any idea that it might mean surrendering some of his traditional privilege. That's when I think we'd see a, a change there, a hardening, and, and we would see a man not a heck of a lot different from Mr. Casalban. Time for a change of picture. I love this little cartoon. I'm going to have to educate myself as to who all the different personages are. I think on the left-hand side of the seesaw, the gentleman in the blue jacket and white trousers, I feel fairly sure that's Wellington. But uh, apart from that, I'm going to have to study the faces. So on the, so on the left-hand side of the seesaw, I think that is the conservatives under, the, under George IV, the old king, I think. I may be wrong. And then on the, on the lower side, the side that is, that is weighing down, that's, that's obviously the reform side because you've got a gentleman there waving his, his little scroll that says reform. But you can see right at the end of that seesaw, there's a crown. In other words, these are, the, these are, I think, the Whigs who now have the support of the new king, and that's why they are now heavier. I suppose if it was a tug of war, it would, you know, it would be, they would be, they'd be pulling. I do not know who the gentleman is standing in the middle who, who has to bear the weight of this seesaw on his back. I must figure it out because I find, I find these old political cartoons fascinating. I think they must have been so meaningful to everyone, you know, at the time. And we, we look at them and go, what? Because we don't know all the, all the characters involved. This cartoonist, I don't think he's, particularly keen on reform because he's put this denizen from from hell who's got reform on it as a notice sort of pushed onto his horns. I don't know what the meaning of that is. Maybe down in hell they're all really pleased that reform is going ahead. I, I don't know. Don't know about that, where, where, the, where the cartoonist opinion stands politically. I'd like to study this more, but I just thought it was a, a really good backdrop. To conclude everything that we've been saying so far with our quotes from BT, and by the way, of course, the citation for BT, which I got from JSTOR. You can read the whole article for free on there. I'm going to put the, the link in the description box, as usual. So in addition for watching out for references about the 17th century and the Civil War and Puritanism, which we've been doing, and, and I've been seeing those as interesting historical allusions because Dorothea is so reform-minded. She's got a, a Puritan spirit that wants to change things. And it never occurred to me, well, of course she does. Where is she right now in England? She's at a, a critical time when, when England politically began to move, move toward the modern, move toward what you know we're more used to, I'm more used to. So we're going to have to watch out for those mentions of contemporary politics too, I think, and make a big, a, a bigger deal of, point out the fact that here we go. You can see that uh, George Eliot carefully looking up all these, and she did have to look up. That was the other thing. Now, I I didn't make a note of that. There was another article that I was reading last night. I will try to add that into the description box. 
But there was a, an article which said that uh, George Eliot had to spend a lot of time researching at the British Library to, in order to write Middlemarch and make sure she got all the, the political details correct because she would have been far, far too young to have been aware of exactly what happened at the time, but also that she hated going to the British Library. Now, the article writer did not explain what was so awful. I, I, I love the British Library. <laughs> So I was thinking, I wonder, I wonder what she found. Uh, maybe they weren't very kind to her. I mean, it did occur to me, I wonder what it was like if you walked into the British Library in the middle of the 19th century as a woman. You know, did you get any respect if you wanted to use the reading room? Did people look at you like, are you sure? You know, d d d perhaps you, your husband can come and read the books himself, you know. <laughs> Sorry, I'm 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 being sarcastic, but I I just wonder what the attitude would have been if if people would have been you know would have treated her with respect if maybe that was the reason she didn't like the library. But that's pure speculation. But I will add that into the description box because it was an interesting article as well. Again, talking about how Elliot had to do the research to 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 ground this story in this period of history, this pivotal period, which I keep making this hand gesture for. Shall we keep doing? That? My, my gesture for Middlemarch, it, it may, and it, it goes with the political cartoon, right? The seesaw is, is moving, another side is going up and another side is going down. And that's it for today. This is a slightly shorter meditation than we've had, but if I remember correctly, Meditation 10, the one before this, it went on a little too long for my liking. I, was, I didn't want you to think I'd set a precedent there. I, I don't like videos to get too long. It matters to me. So thanks, everybody, for checking out this Middlemarch Meditations. Hope to see you again next time. Take care. Bye-bye.